So to continue with our history of science, we've now reached uh, World War I, early 1900s. So World War I ends, 1918, and Germany is forced to sign this Treaty of Versailles that has this <laughs> guilt clause. So actually, when Germany loses, they're forced to sign this thing basically saying it's all Germany's fault. And if you've ever been forced to apologize to somebody, maybe when you're a kid, you know that that's not actually an effective strategy because it causes resentment. And Germany resents this, and what then happens is that Hitler exploits that, right? So all Germany needs is someone to come in and tell them it wasn't their fault and everybody else was being unfair instead. So a guy called Lenin returns to Russia and he leads what's called the Communist Revolution. So Russia is this very large country. Lenin installs communism, which is a new form of government in Russia. And the reason we talk about this is because Lenin put a guy called Trofim Lysenko in charge of Soviet agriculture and biology. So here's Lenin, here's uh, Lysenko, just look at this and you can see that he's, he's going to be the bad guy, right? So Trofim Lysenko is put in charge of Soviet biology, basically, and this is almost 40 years. And what did Lysenko believe? Well, Lysenko didn't believe in genetics. And in fact, if you think about it, so he actually described um, genetics as a bourgeois pseudoscience. And one of the reasons that he didn't like genetics is because Nazis did believe in genetics, right? Nazis were all about genetic differences between individuals, and of course, they thought themselves were the best. Nazis were geneticists. The Soviets did not get along with the Nazis, right? World War II was a big war between them. So this guy in charge, by denying genetics, it's actually very politically uh, favorable, right? To deny the science that your enemies are all in favor of. So this is part of how he keeps this job of being in charge of biology for 40 years without believing in genetics because it fits the kind of political ideology of the leadership. Any scientist who disagreed with him, who thought genes were important, he would just lock them up or kill them. He promoted Lamarckian type techniques, right? So he had this idea that, well, just like people aren't different from each other because there are no genetic differences and hard work is what causes people to be more or less successful, not genes, the same thing for plants, right? So you don't need to worry about kind of coming up with different strains of plants to try to grow, what you should focus on more is maybe the fertilizer or something, right? So all of agriculture becomes obsessed with fertilizers and watering schedules instead of actually trying to select strains of plants that will grow better because that's based on genes which he doesn't believe exists. So for a major part of the 20th century, the Soviet Union is run by a guy who has a totally ideologically formed view of biology, right? Hard work and no genetic differences is what communists believe, and it's what he then mandated biologists believe. This had a really negative effect in the Soviet Union. Soviet genetic science was set back 50 years. They really fell behind Europe and the US in terms of understanding of biology. And this is a really powerful cautionary tale and this stands as an example for the real reason why scientists worry about creationism, which we've talked about earlier in the course. It's not because scientists are afraid of religion or anything like that. What scientists fear is putting ideology into science, right? When you mix up your science with what you wish was true, like communism, you can derail your science and do things wrong for a really long time and we have a clear example of the Soviet Union doing that. So the reason why modern biologists are so kind of against creationism being taught in school, aside from the fact that it's wrong, it's that when you take religious ideologies or political ideologies and f impose them on science, you cause major problems like this country being backwards. So we don't want to do that in the US. So we try to keep our ideology out of our science. Now we come to the 1930s and 40s, just after World War I. And these three individuals here, R.A. Fisher, J.B.S. Haldane, and Sewell Wright, these three people are going to be responsible for something called the modern synthesis, also called neo-Darwinism. And what these three individuals did separately and then also together is they reconciled Mendelianism, genetics, right, particulate inheritance, with natural selection. So remember, we had Mendel's laws being rediscovered, and people didn't think that that matched with natural selection. What these guys did is they used population genetics, so that's math, 
they invented population genetics and modeled evolution as the change in gene frequencies in populations explains evolution. So R.A. Fisher in 1918 showed that Mendelism was consistent with biometrics, right? These two different camps aren't actually different after all. If you have lots of genes that each have a small effect, then a bell curve distribution is what you expect, right? The normal distribution, when you learned about it in biostats, came out of a large number of trials with different options. If you just have a large number of genes with different alleles, you get a normal distribution. Obviously, this is a very statistical way of thinking about it. So in fact, Fisher invented a number of the different statistical techniques that are still used today. So he's taking his mathematical knowledge of distributions and allowing Mendelism to be reconciled with biometrics. J.B.S. Haldane is doing many of the same things. He wrote an influential book, and he's kind of best known for this observation that your genes are also in some of your relatives. So in fact, helping your relatives might be helping some of the genes that you have, and then they will pass on some of the genes. They're kind of on passing on pieces of yourself. There was a famous story. He was in a bar once, and he was talking about this, and someone asked, well, if your brother was drowning in the river, would you jump in to save your brother, right, if you're going to talk about this? And Haldane said, well, no, I wouldn't jump in to save my brother, but I would jump in to save eight cousins, right, because eight cousins would add up to one of him genetically. And then Sewell Wright, that's this guy here, um, he was famous for cleaning chalkboards with guinea pigs. In addition to that, he made a number of other contributions, this modern synthesis. He's the first person who really thought about inbreeding and how this can actually be a problem. If you're mating with your relatives, then you're getting the same gene showing up kind of both times, right? And if that gene is bad, that causes problems. Um, he had the first description of genetic drift, that the frequencies of the alleles in a population may change over time, even if there's not natural selection. And that, in fact, you can visualize evolution as a population moving around on a fitness landscape. That's something we'll be talking about um, later in the course. So this is a very influential metaphor. This is a really good observation about how maybe selection isn't responsible for everything. But all three of these guys are using mathematics to solve this conflict that had existed between Mendelian genetics and the theory of evolution, and they're doing it with math. So mathematics in the 20s, 30s, and 40s is reconciling genetics with evolution and causing this neo-Darwinism, right? Allowing evolution to be bolstered, to be supported, and then to really get to the position that it is now where it is the accepted explanation for both the pattern and the process. Moving on through the 20th century, we have Thomas Hunt Morgan. He won the 1933 Nobel Prize for describing that genes were on chromosomes, right? There was a big debate about where those genes were in cells. And he's one of the first people that started working with Drosophila, right? Fruit flies. And that's one of his model organisms he used to make this kind of large discovery that genes were on chromosomes. Theodos Dobsansky, one of um, his students, one of his kind of academic descendants, he studied the population genetics of Drosophila in the wild, wrote a book, Genetics and the Origin of Species, and he's taking the kind of lab organism and the genes and the population genetics from the previous slide and then using it and going out into the wild and able to describe things there. So we're taking these ideas from math and ideas from the lab, bringing them into the wild. Julian Huxley wrote a book called The Modern Synthesis, Unifying Math and Evolution. He is unfortunately remembered for being a proponent of eugenics. So this idea that, okay, if things are evolving and humans are evolving, maybe we would like to figure out how to make us evolve the way we think we should which is um, not such a popular idea now. But you can see these ideas of evolution now getting into maybe ideas about society, right? This idea is becoming very influential. Uh, then we kind of have World War II in the middle of the 20th century, which kind of derails science for a while until we finish World War II. 